Imagine your roster of movements for a given area, like a sports team. Come on, Jeff. Everybody knows there's only one true analogy as it relates to exercise variation in the training program. And it has nothing to do with sports teams, man. What the heck is that? What do you think, guys? Should I, uh... Should I keep rocking the V? What's up, guys? Alec Ankiri here. I know it's being a little facetious in the intro there, but I watched Jeffrey Verdi Schofield's recent video on exercise rotation and variation and the essential role that that plays in proper programming and consistently coaxing on progress in the long term. It was a great video, highly informative. It's linked below in the description, and I encourage you all to go check it out. After watching my video, of course, Jeff's video, though, gave me a whole bunch of thoughts that I wanted to expound on. So, so that's what I'm going to do here today. Somewhat mishmashy. And I can respond to his whole video. I do agree with most of it. I disagree with some minor aspects. But mostly, I just want to add on my own thoughts because I had a whole bunch of them after watching his video. Now, the analogy that Jeff used in his video to discuss exercise rotation was that of a sports team. Well, the analogy that I think is a good one, actually, I heard this from Basement Bodybuilding, is that imagine your roster of movements for a given area like a sports team each player is a movement now you don't just swap all the players at once basically you do what they do in sports you take one player out you put one player in then you wait a little while you take one player out you put one player in it's the same thing with your training program <laughs> And just real quick guys, if you're in the market for a top-notch meal prep company, then be sure to check out Flex Pro Meals and use code on Kiri Elite for 20% off your order. The link is in the description. The food's legit. It usually arrives in just a couple days. They have a bunch of different high-protein meal options, and it's a really easy and convenient way to help keep your diet and your macros on a track. And now, back to your regularly scheduled program. Now, I actually thought this was a great analogy and a great way to really look at the situation. And actually, what it reminded me of was an analogy that I always use when it comes to this topic of exercise rotation, exercise variation in a training program, across a training program, across a training cycle. And that analogy is what I call the ship analogy. So I will preface this by saying that, personally, I have been running the same damn training program probably going on five or six years now. Shocker, right? Except with one caveat. The program that I'm running today bears absolutely zero resemblance to the program that I was running five years ago. So how the hell does that make any sense at all? For it to make sense, we have to look at the ship analogy. The ship analogy tells a story of a ship out at sea. Every now and then the ship has to dock at the harbor, right? So when it's docked at the harbor, you observe it. You check all the parts and the pieces and you make sure that everything looks good before you take it back out to sea again. Now, during your quality check, you're probably going to notice a few dings and dents, a few damaged planks here and there. No big deal, right? You just replace those damaged planks, just one or two here and there. And then you go back out to sea again for a little while. A few weeks later, a few months later, whatever it is, you dock at the harbor again and you do another quality check on the ship. With that, you end up having to replace a couple more damaged planks. And this happens gradually over time, one by one, bit by bit, piece by piece, you replace those damaged planks until eventually, after enough time has passed, none of the original planks that comprise the original ship remain as part of its current existing structure. So then the question becomes, is it still the same ship? It is, but it isn't, right? And it's the same thing with your training program. Bit by bit, plank by plank, exercise by exercise, just one by one, gradually over time, we replace the damaged planks on our ship. We swap out the stale exercises from our training program for new variations until eventually we have an entirely brand new training program. That's just how training is, okay? It's not a fixed point where everything stops and the new program ends. It is a continuous game. But the beauty of it is, we never actually switched programs at all. And that is how proper exercise rotation occurs. It, it's a gradual process, bit by bit over time, that completely revamps the face of the entire training program. And we can sit here and bicker over the details and, and the minutia about when this should occur, how often it should occur, with what movements it should occur, etc., etc. But no matter what, 
we all agree that it is a fundamental principle that really is one of the primary drivers of progress in the long run. But speaking of bickering over the minutia, if we analyze Jeff's analogy a little bit more closely, the bit about the star players essentially never coming out of the rotation, no matter how quote unquote fatigued that they are at any given moment in time. I have some movements that stay in my program pretty much forever. They are full time staples. They are literally irreplaceable. Even if they are fatigued, uh, even if they are not getting the same stimulus as they used to, they are still the best possible option for their spot. With an assertion like that, it almost becomes a philosophical question, one that you could argue one way or the other, simply depending on the perspective that you choose to view the concept from. For example, I would say that if your goal is general strength and hypertrophy, that you probably should be doing the squat pretty much year round, 52 weeks a year as part of your training program. But it shouldn't just be the back squat, right? Because if you pound that specific variant into a pulp, then it isn't going to be helping you very much after whatever given period of time. No matter how good your star player is, if both of his legs are broken, then he's not really helping the team anymore, is he? But there are a hundred different viable variations of the squat that can be rotated in and out and cycled through across the entire training program. You can switch the positioning of the bar. You can change bars. You can squat down to pins. You can squat up off of pins, you can squat to a box, you can pause your squats, you can tinker with different depths, etc, etc, etc. And when you add all these options up, the potential variations, the potential permutations, they become pretty much endless. You're still squatting, you're just doing it slightly differently. Your star player is still in the game, it's just that you were smart enough to have more than one star on the roster. And then beyond that, learning how to extract the most value from each different specific variation becomes an important factor as well. But the point is now you're viewing the program in terms of movement patterns rather than simply just movements. And when you broaden the perspective like that, it opens up a heck of a lot of doors. And this is something that I've tried to do with all my training templates as well, those cookie cutter programs that are available on my website. So for example, none of those are just generic cookie cutter training programs. None of them say, okay, today you just squat or today you just bench press, but rather, Instead, the entire program is built around movement patterns. Every option is categorized into different movement patterns. And rather than simply assigning movements, I instead assigned movement patterns into the program. And then I provide you guys with the tools to know how and when and where to fill in those blanks. However, you do have to be careful about this because you can always make faster progress on a new movement. Uh, I think Dave McConey made a fantastic post about this, and it's something that I see all the time. So basically, you're making this progress on an old movement, and then you swap in a new movement, and, and wow, now you're making great progress, and you think this is muscle growth. It's not. It's not. Slow progress on an old movement, at least you know that it's not skill, it's not neurological, you're not just, you know, learning positioning or whatever. It is actual growth, as long as it's for reps and everything else is consistent. But if you swap in a new movement, a lot of that is just learning the movement. And a lot more movements are a lot more neurological than you actually think. So Now this is a very bodybuilder centric mentality in my opinion because muscle growth, m muscle tissue accrued is not the only metric to base the success of your training program on. There are many other variables that can be improved upon as well that are just as valuable to seek to improve or to even accidentally improve as a side effect of what you're doing. Jeff talks about skill in executing a particular movement or neurological adaptations. And to me, those are both things that are worth improving upon and that we should seek to improve upon in their own rights. Developing the widest base of movement skill and neurological adaptation is gonna make you a much more resilient, well-rounded and skilled lifter and athlete in the long run. And why would you not want to become more skilled in a general sense. And honestly, even if muscle growth is your only primary goal, I mean, you're gonna tap out your genetic potential for hypertrophy over the course of a 10 or 20 year training career. It's basically inevitable, right? Assuming that you eat enough and consistently and sufficiently bust your ass over that time span. So to me, 
even for a bodybuilder or a pseudo bodybuilder, just somebody who wants to maximize hypertrophy, worrying about the, the potential hypertrophic or catabolic impact of rotating through variations too quickly in order to acquire new skills and, and a wider neurological base, it's kind of missing the forest for the trees, in my opinion, when you are looking at the bigger picture, the, the duration of a training career. I know someone's gonna be like, <clears throat> conjugate, what's up with that? This kind of like goes against what you're saying. I think in this case, because you are maxing out and because the limiting factor is probably your joints, especially as you get stronger, it might make sense to do a variety of movements if only to stay in one piece. So let's say you do high bar back squat for a one rep max and then next week you're going to go again. Maybe you want to vary it a little bit. Maybe you want to do low bar. Maybe you want to use safety squat bar. Maybe you want to use bands or chains or something else like that just to get a slightly different stimulus. To me, this makes sense, but it's still not my cup of tea for hypertrophy. And often in these plans, you'll see the accessory movements be a little bit more stable. And I think if you're just interested in muscle growth, you don't even necessarily need to max out at all. Yeah, he hit the nail dead on the head with this one. The purpose of the max effort work with the conjugate system is primarily to build limit strength. It's not specifically for hypertrophy. So the, the fact that you're rotating those max effort movements on a very frequent basis is not suboptimal in this case. In this case, it actually works to achieve the goal very well because, and especially the stronger you become, the more intense of a stimulus that you can get from those single instance training effects, that one exposure to a single variation, right? Especially as you learn how to push your body harder and harder across a spectrum of different variations. This is distinct from the point mentioned above about fake progress because hypertrophy, in a general sense, is less dependent on force production anyway and more dependent on simply making the muscles tired under sufficient tension and force production can help with that but wasting time and energy learning how to maximize that capacity and that output is just that it's a waste of resources however the way i see it the the issue here is not necessarily the frequency of the rotation itself but rather the act of working with weights that are heavier than optimal for the purposes of hypertrophy with volume that is too low to maximally induce it. So that would be what's happening with the max effort method in the conjugate system. I, however, I would argue that after building up a moderate base, one actually could maximize long-term muscle hypertrophy even with something like a conjugate system, even by rotating their primary variations every single workout so long as training volume was high enough and the weights were kept in that moderate sweet spot that is best for inducing hypertrophy. So basically, I would say you could tweak the conjugate system into a pure hypertrophy program if it was something that you really wanted to do, but in its native state, it is primarily a strength program first and foremost. The word conjugate literally refers to the different forms of something. So that variation, the rotational aspect of that system, it's literally the heart of the system. The, the max effort method, the repetition method effort, blah, repetition effort method, the dynamic effort method, those are all secondary components, but it is that rotation that is the heart of the system. So you could modify that still while keeping the heart of the system, you could modify those secondary aspects to suit any goal that you wanted the program to suit, whether it be performance, strength, or hypertrophy in this case. As well, on conjugate still, with the tertiary work and the accessory work, the primary aim with those movements does become to both shore up weak links as well as to build muscle. Now, muscle to support the strength, whereas the, the primary movements, the primary goal with those movements is to build strength directly in and of itself. The rest of it is support for that strength via hypertrophy primarily. And so that is where you're going to start to see those higher volumes on, on these exercises, as well as the lower training intensities to accommodate that. And you're also going to start to see less variation as well, less rotation through exercises. As Jeff noted, that is how I've been setting it up myself as well in the conjugate conjugate style programs that I've been writing and the conjugish program that I will be releasing later this year. And like I said, I, I don't, I don't think though that frequent variation is the enemy of hypertrophy per se. 
I think it has more to do with the parameters around how you actually set the exercises up. But with a conjugate plan where you're rotating the movements, uh, the main movements very frequently, it does become somewhat prudent to introduce some stability somewhere in the program. And that would be better served in these tertiary and accessory slots, as well as in some of the secondary slots also. Anyway, that pretty much wraps up the main pieces that I wanted to cover here today. Like I said, kind of mishmashy, but I think that there are a few gems in there that you can pluck at, pick out if you search for them. So go check out Jeff's video. It's linked below in the description. It was a great video, Jeff, very informative. I always enjoy pieces like that that make me think enough so that I end up with all these extra ideas that I really end up wanting to talk about and expound upon for my audience as well. So good stuff, man. Guys, remember to like, sub, comment, all that crap. Check out on CareLeapFitness.com for online coaching and training programs. And as always, keep training hard. I will catch you guys next time.